I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Our blessed Lord is speaking to the crowd, and it's important for us to recognize to whom he's speaking. So it was for the generality of the Jews who were present. Indeed, they may even be, have been non-Jews as well. The crowd had followed him because he'd fed them the five loaves and the two fish. He, he tells them not to labor for the food that perishes, but rather for that which leads to eternal life. They ask for this food that leads to eternal life. And he said, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. And he places the adjective living. In other words, it has life in it. And he goes on to say what this bread will do. Anyone who eats of it will live forever. So he's promising everlasting life as a consequence of eating this bread. And this is in contrast to Adam who ate, but not life, death for himself and for all of us his descendants. The bread that our Lord has promised us and that will give us um, eternal life is his flesh which he says he's given for the life of the world. Our Lord has been very graphic. The Jews understand him exactly. They understand him literally. How do we know? Because they say, they started arguing one with another. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were trying to find a way that it could be interpreted without being literal. But what does our Lord do? He reinforces what he has said by being even more literal. And he does so on six occasions, six different times, he reiterates the same thing. I tell you, he says, most solemnly, so he's using an oath, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man, which is what he said, and drink his blood, this is making it worse because the Jews didn't even touch blood. It was to, to touch blood, especially human blood, was to, to uh, be profa pro um, pro profaned. They were unclean. So he says, and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. So our Lord has already made it worse by bringing in his blood as well. And this is very literal, but he goes on. Who, uh, anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life. So he's blocked it off at both ends. If you eat, you will have life. If you don't eat, you will not have it. He's blocked both ends off. And he continues, I shall raise him up on the last day. So again, he's talking about eternal life. And he's speaking about the body, because what is being raised up? Only that which fell down. The only thing that can fall down is our bodies. So he's, going to, he's promising us in this verse the resurrection of the body. But he goes on. He doesn't just leave it like that. He says, for my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. 
Why the word real? Because he's saying this is literal. I'm not speaking of a, in, in metaphors. I'm not speaking a parable. I'm not speaking in images. This is not a type. This is it. It is real. Literal. You have to accept it. And he says both in regard to his flesh and to his blood. And then he goes on to say the consequences of it. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, I live in him. So now there is an intermingling. So whereas before he'd said this would happen at the end, I will raise him up, so it means we have to die. But he said, no, but even now, whilst you're living, there is this co-mingling, this intermingling of us with him. So he lives in us because we have partaken of him. We live in him because we're members of his mystical body. So in a real sense, he's saying that the Eucharist, his flesh, is also the food for the church. This is what makes the church. He continues, as I, who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats in you draw life from me. So now he brings in the Father, the work of the Father. He draws life from the Father because he's the Son of the Father, the eternal Son of the eternal Father, being begotten from all time. And the life comes from the Father. And so he, our Lord Christ, is saying, that our life will come from him in much the same way. He goes on lastly to say, this is a bread come down from heaven, referring to the manna, but the manna was only a type, it's only a symbol, it was not real, in as much as it pointed to something else, but Christ's flesh and blood is the end, it's the reality. This is a bread come down from heaven, not like the manna, the bread our ancestors say they are dead, because they didn't eat spiritually. But anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And my brothers and sisters, the only place you'll find this bread, the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, is in the Catholic Church and nowhere else. Anywhere else you will find only bread and only wine, if that. But in the Catholic Church we do not receive bread and wine, but only the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we receive it for eternal life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, on the 15th of August, the Church universally celebrates the glorious assumption of our Blessed Lady into heaven. This feast is the oldest and the most important of the Marian feasts, and it commemorates one of the four Marian dogmas that we currently have. To begin with, you must understand that the assumption of Our Lady was declared to be a doctrine of the Church, that is, it is part of the inheritance of the church. It's always been believed by the church. But in more recent times, 1950 to be exact, the Pope, Pius XII, answering the, the um, appeals of the whole Catholic world, declared Our Lady's assumption in heaven to be a truth, a dogma, a doctrine revealed by God himself. The Pope is very careful in his language he said it had been revealed because it did not be, there was no explicit um, narrative in the scriptures of the Assumption of Our Lady. However, throughout the scriptures, we find types, we find images of Our Lady's Assumption. So whether we begin in Genesis, where the Lord um, says in, in, in Cursing the Serpent, said that he placed enmity between the woman and her seed, and the serpent and his seed, and that the woman would crush the head of the serpent, or through the various um, prophets, the historical books. In, in fact, in the Cantil Canticles, we read, who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as the army set in battle array? And of course, in the um, Apocalypse, in, the ch in chapter 12, we read about a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon with the crown of 12 stars, and, and so on. So in all of these images, we see 
a type of Our Lady's Assumption into Heaven. The question, of course, is um, why, why should we believe this and how does it benefit us? Well, the first question is easy to answer. Why should we believe it? Because it's a truth and it's a truth revealed by God and it's taught definitively by the church. So that's taken care of. The second, how does it benefit us? In, it benefits us in that it gives us a clearer understanding of the importance of the body and the destiny to which we, body and soul, are called to. There are four Marian dogmas. The first is that of her divine maternity, Mother of God. The second, that of her perpetual virginity. The third is the Immaculate Conception. And the fourth is the Assumption. And I noted these historically. Okay. These were defined historically by the Church, beginning with the Divine Maternity in 431 at the Council of Ephesus. But how, does that, how do they re relate? How do they hold together? Very simply. Adam's sin was a personal sin. Adam had been warned by God that if he disobeyed, if he ate the fruit, he would die the death. Adam disobeyed. And so he became the subject of death. But not only he, but all his descendants, all of us, we are subject to death because of Adam's disobedience. The sin, two th from Adam's sin, two things follow. First is concupiscence, which is the rebellion of the body against the spirit, against the soul. And St. Paul, of course, tells us, um, you know, how is it that the law of righteousness, which I know I should obey, I find so difficult to do, and the law of sin and lawlessness, which I should not obey, is the very thing that I do. Who can free me? So this concupiscence is part and parcel, the first effect, actually, of original sin. The second effect, result of original sin, is death itself, the separation of body and soul. Now, our blessed Lord, who is God, took flesh from the womb of the Virgin. He became man. He was not subject to death. He is the Lord of life. He is the eternal Son of God. He had no human father, and therefore he could not inherit Adam's sin, which is passed through the Father. In taking um, human flesh to himself, he automatically made Mary, the most holy virgin, to be his mother, and consequently the mother of a person who is God, for which reason we call her mother of God. We do not mean by that that she conceived God in his divine nature, but rather we affirm that she conceived the second person, the Blessed Trinity, who is God, and gave to him a human nature. So she's mother of this person who is human and um, who is also God. Now, God in his goodness had no desire that his mother should be for a single moment under the influence of the serpent. It says so in Genesis, I put enmity between you and the woman. And therefore at no moment in time could the Blessed Virgin be a subject of Satan. She, there, there was, there was, it's like light and darkness. There was, there was absolutely no um, concourse be, between them. And so the first, consequence of her, this, this um, gift, this preservation from original sin, we call her Immaculate Conception, that she was conceived without sin, and that she lived a life that was sinless. And this is demonstrated by the fact that she had overcome, she was not subject to concupiscence. And this is demonstrated by the church's, by, by the, by our, the church's dogma of Our Lady's um, perpetual virginity. And so we come to the last, the second effect of sin, which is death. 
Since Our Lady did not sin, since she was immaculately conceived, she was not subject to death. So how could she overcome death? By not being subject to it. In other words, the, in, in uh, Munificentissimus Deus, the bull of Pius XII, 1st of November, 1950, the Pope said at the end of her life, at the end of her earthly life, the Blessed Virgin Mary was taken up body and soul into heaven. And this is a dogma revealed by God. So she is taken up. So the, the Pope didn't say that she died, but rather at the end of her earthly life. So this would embrace either the fact that she died or didn't die, but when her earthly life was over, she was taken up by God into heaven, body and soul. And this is a promise to us that we who, because of original sin and because of our own sins are subject to death, at the moment of our death, our soul departs from our body. The soul will go to God for judgment. The body will decay, will, will have no longer have life. It will be buried and it will await the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Yet God in his goodness to give us encouragement has preserved the bodies of some of his saints. So even after centuries, they are still incorrupt. This is a sign that, that of the destiny of the body, which is that it should enjoy eternal life as, as, as a, a reward for fidelity to God. And so Our Lady precedes all of them inasmuch as she is taken up body and soul. Her, uh, it, uh, her body then is preserved from the corruption of the grave. And it's, she, this was, in fact, some of the, the, the finest theologians have said that she died of love. That is, she had reached at such a high point of grace that she could no longer remain separated from her son. And so she willingly left this valley of tears to ascend into heaven amid the chorus of angels who cry out, who is this that comes as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array. Most Holy Mary, assumed to the heaven, pray for us, your children, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The islands of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have long been cherished for their stunning natural beauty and vibrant culture. But in the wake of Hurricane Beryl, these islands are now marked by scenes of destruction. On July 1st, hurricane made landfall with furious winds and torrential winds, leaving many areas struggling to recover from the damage. One of the most severely impacted areas is the island of Mayo, known for its charming landscape and close-knit community. Here, the Church of the Immaculate Conception, a 90-year-old stone structure, which is a significant historical landmark, was almost completely destroyed by the hurricane. The church has been a cornerstone of community life for decades, serving not only as a place of worship, but also as a gathering point for local events and celebrations. In fact, many residents of the community sheltered in the church during the passage of the hurricane. Bishop County gives us his experience on visiting the islands following the passage of the hurricane. The hurricane took place on a Monday. By the Friday, I was down there and I was just, I, I, I was just devastated. You know, I, I never, first time I've experienced a hurricane in my life in the first place. Mm. And so it was really, you know, but I was just there with the people. Um, but the devastation is total. The loss of the Church of the Immaculate Conception has galvanized efforts to raise funds for its reconstruction. Archbishop Robert Rivas, Archbishop Eremetus of Castries, and a former Bishop of Kingstown has launched a fundraising initiative in Trinidad 
to aid in the church's reconstruction. His deep connection to the region and commitment to the community rebuilding are the driving forces behind this initiative. We are hoping our target is $50,000 for the walk. I'm hoping to make much more, raise much more than that, you know, in other efforts for rebuilding the Church of the Immaculate Conception on Myro, which was a beautiful little cut stone church. In addition to local fundraising, the Archdiocese of Castries took up a special collection on July 28th to support the victims of Hurricane Beryl. The funds raised will be directed towards providing immediate relief and long-term recovery efforts for the communities in need. The relief efforts are further bolstered by regional organizations such as Caritas Antilles and YAC St. Lucia, which have played critical roles in delivering much needed supplies to the affected areas. Their partnership has already resulted in two successful missions to St. Vincent, where they have distributed essential items like food, water, and medical supplies to those most in need. YEAC stands for the um, Youth Emergency Action Committees. And we're a, we're a project of Caritas Antilles. Today we're gearing up for our third response so far to the countries affected by Hurricane Burial, that includes Grenada and St. Vincent. This time, um, as a project of Caritas Antilles, we're taking seven volunteers along with ourselves to the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as the islands of Bekwe, Kanawan, and Union Island to help those who were affected by the storm. As St. Vincent and the Grenadines move forward on a path to recovery, the enduring spirit of community and cooperation offers hope for a brighter future. With continued support from regional partners and international allies, the islands are steadily rebuilding and restoring their vibrant way of life. This is Ronald Novel for Catholic Television Broadcasting Service. On Friday, August 9th, family and friends, including the staff of CTBS, said farewell to Miss Rosemary Binks Cooper. Ms. Cooper, who served as the manager of the Catholic Television Broadcasting Service for over 30 years, having succeeded Father E. Govery, FMI, who co-founded CTBS along with her. Ms. Cooper passed away on July 17, peacefully, at the Marriott Hope. She was 80 years old. She will be jelly missed by all. May her soul rest in God's perfect peace. <laughs>